Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. We're starting um, uh, the uh, last two epistles that we will deal with. Uh, Paul, we're not going to do Hebrews, I, although I think, I believe Paul wrote Hebrews. We're not going to include this in this teaching on the life and teachings of Paul. Uh, we are going to wrap this series up. We started in January of 2014. <laughs> that was 2014. <laughs> Thought I would be done by the summer of 2014, and here we are in the fall of 2015. Just didn't know it was going to take so long to cover it. Hallelujah. <clears throat> um, the last week's lesson on, on Titus, and then this, uh, the next few weeks as we cover First and Second Timothy, or what are referred to as the pastoral epistles. These are epistles that, uh, you know, Paul had personal. You know, now, uh, this, these are written in his what some refer to as the second imprisonment. We do know that definitely they're after the first imprisonment in around 63, 64 AD. Um, uh, last week was, was one of his pastoral epistles to Titus. And then the last two letters we have now, scholars disagree. When you're, you're dealing, in, you know, 2,000 years ago, and you're dealing with six, seven months apart on something, you, you know, you can disagree. Okay, or eight months apart. Of, was First Timothy before Titus, or was Titus before First Timothy? You know, they're written about. They're written in the same, <clears throat> same few months. Okay, so we went ahead and covered Titus as being done um, <coughs> prior to the epistles to Timothy. We will be covering his last two letters, and of course, these are the last two letters before Paul was executed, um, and before Paul was, actually was beheaded. And so we will um, we will get into this. Let's go first of all into the first, oh, maybe the first, uh, let's go to the first three verses here. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior. Now remember, he only uses this phrase, God our Savior, like three or four times, and all times are in the pastoral epistles. Now remember, if I, you hear me say pastoral epistles, first, second Timothy, and Titus, okay? So when I make that reference, those are the three books I'm making reference to, Okay? And um, to God, of God our Savior, and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. Unto Timothy, mine own son in the faith. Now, either Paul converted him or Paul trained him up. You know, we're, we're, um, we're not definitely sure, but, you know, you, you could go either way. He's a son. In other words, he was his spiritual father. Uh, Dad Hagen didn't lead me to the Lord, but he came out and became my spiritual father. And so uh, this is where we are. Uh, Paul, refers, I mean, Timoth uh, Paul refers to Timothy as his son. Hallelujah. Uh, in the faith, praise God, mine own son, his own son, dear to Paul was Timothy. Grace, mercy, and peace, this is the only, in the pastoral epistles is where Paul uses this combination of things, grace, mercy, and peace. Everywhere else you'll see him use the traditional greeting of grace and peace, but in the pastorals he uses grace, mercy, and peace um, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I figure, I was, I was kind of meditating on that, and I thought, you know, maybe it's because pastors need a lot more mercy. <laughs> <laughs> That's all that I can figure. Pastors just need a lot of mercy uh, to get through what they've got they have to deal with and stuff. So, uh, grace, mercy, and peace. That was supposed to be a funny. From, uh, maybe if I was going to minister's conference, I would get a bigger laugh. I, <laughs> hallelujah. From God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus while I went into Macedonia. Now, remember, we don't have our map, but they remember Paul. Uh, had been down, had over, had been over Ephesus and over in Macedonia. He had been all over those regions in those three missionary trips, and then you know he was he was imprisoned. And um, we don't have our map up there. I could we could point out the map, but you know he, this is the area that he traveled in so much and ministered so much. Ephesus became a focal point of the church and a, and a crossroads of ministry there. Paul left Timothy there to oversee the work in Ephesus as he went on into Macedonia. And listen to this that thou mightest charge some that teach no other doctrine. Neither give heed to fables and endless, geneal excuse me, endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, so do. Now, let's stop here. He, he left in there for a reason. What's that? To teach no other doctrine. Paul did not just leave it at the whim of people coming, well, I think this and I think that. You know, we have to be sound in doctrine. 
It is important to be sound in doctrine. Well, just as long as you love the Lord and the Lord loves you and we just kind of love Jesus. No, that's not enough. We need to be sound in doctrine. Paul left Timothy for the express purpose to teach people so they would remain sound in doctrine. They would teach no other doctrine than what he had taught. He wasn't going, I don't want them to come in here and teach anything else. And then he told them, neither give heed to fables or myths and in, endless genealogies. Now the, reason, now, the reason that is here, uh, one of the things that Paul was dealing with here in Ephesus was not as much Gnostics as it was Judaizers. You remember the Gnostics were coming in a lot of places and they were teaching that, you know, the, the natural world was evil and, it was, and material was evil. Therefore, it wasn't really important as long as you did the spiritual thing right. And Jesus didn't come in the flesh. He was only spiritual and all these things. And, you know, sin was of the of material world. So it didn't matter because you weren't of material. You were, you were uh, spiritual only. Crazy stuff. And he, he dealt with them over and over again. But in this case, he's dealing with Judaizers. It is believed that the Judaizers thought that you had to be pure in genealogy to have leadership roles. In other words, they weren't going to give up their power positions even in the new, in the new church and in the, in the gospel of Christ. Now, that's the problem with this. When you begin to preach a gospel of inclusion, now, I don't mean the gospel of inclusion means you can become a homosexual and live as a homosexual. You can live as an adulterer. You can live as a fornicator. You can live as a drunkard. You can live as a drug addict in the church, and it's okay. That's not inclusion. Okay. And I'm not just talking about one sin, I'm talking about all. You can't not have what we call, what people, what people want to refer to inclusion now, meaning, you know, everybody, it doesn't matter what you are, what you do. And they got some lesbian priest over in, in Sweden that is um, taking all the crucif crucifixes down and so that the Muslims can come pray in the church. That's not, that's not, that's not what we're after. No, but when you preach the gospel of inclusion, meaning no matter where you came from, when you come to Christ, you're now one in Christ. Remember, Paul did write in one place, he said that he's broken down the middle wall of partition between us, that is the Jew and the Gentile, may have a make of, one, uh, in, of one, uh, one new man in Christ. We all became one new man in Christ. Okay, so for Paul to preach that because, you know, you were a Gentile, you got saved, and you were Jew, and you got saved, that we're now one in Christ, and for somebody to start teaching, well, yeah, but, you know, you, you're mixed because you came out of the Gentile lineage, I came out of the, Judea, the, Judea, uh, the, the uh, Judea lineage, therefore, I'm the only one that's qualified for leadership because I'm pure. And that's it. They would go back through the genealogies and say, I'm, I'm this, I'm that, I'm that. And, and Paul did that one time in a sarcastic, rhetorical way to show them that, you know, if you're going to depend on that, I'm better than you. Remember that? When he said, you know, born the eighth day of the tribe of Benjamin, da 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 da, -da Jew of Jews. This, he goes on and on and on. And he, was, he said, because if you're depending on your person, mine's higher. You know, Paul did that stuff. Paul would, would fillet you. I, I can't even fathom what Paul would do in the church today. I mean, we wouldn't have filet mignon. We'd have filet everything. Everything would be filleted. Okay? And so he says, don't give heed to fables. One of, the, one of the other things that they did, especially the women in this day, they just make up stuff. Oh, they don't do that in church. Yeah, they do. I deal with stuff people make up. You know, they just make stuff up. I've heard preachers preach stuff. And they just make it up. It's a doctrine. They go teach us stuff, and you're sitting there, and you're going, where did you get that from? God told me. No, he didn't. How do you know he didn't? Because his word says something different. So Paul says, don't give heed to these things, to fables or myths, to endless genealogies, which minister questions. In other words, uh, if Daniel's a Gentile and, and, and uh, Dick's a Jew, and they both got saved and they come into the church, and Dick said, I can... I'm, I'm a Jew of Jews. I, I came out of the tribe of Levi. My, my parents were Levites and da-da-da-da-da. It goes on and on and on and on and on and on. And he says, but you're not. You're, you're a, you're a, you came out of heathenism, and so you are not qualified for leadership, Samoan. That's going to bring a question. Then, then why, why, is, why is Paul preaching that because we're, we're now one new man in Christ? We're on equal footing in Christ. It would minister questions or create questions, Okay. Um, which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith. So do. We mean godly edifying. J Dick was a Jew. He got born again. The Samoan was a Jew. Call the Samoan. Call him Dano. I love Siri. Anyway, now he's a Christian. He's, a, he's born again. We're on equal footing. That's going to minister what? Edifying. We've, we're on the same footing. We're on the same place. In Christ Jesus, we're on equal footing. Amen? One's not better than the other. 
It doesn't matter what my lineage or my past was. I came into Christ and now I'm a new creature. You see? See, we, the, 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 the uh, emphasis of the church is the new creature, not where you came from. For in Christ Jesus, neither, Paul said, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision avails anything, nor uncircumcision, Galatians 5, 6, but the new creature. Or faith, it says in one place it says faith, new, uh, faith works by love. Then in another place he says, but the new creature. That's what matters. We're new creatures in Christ. Can somebody say glory? Now, Paul begins, um, you know, over here in verse 5, and he, he, he begins now to introduce the basic concept of the gospel. What's that? Now, the end of the commandment is love out of a pure heart. Hallelujah. Now, you know, charity, agape. Out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. Anybody know what faith unfeigned means? What unfeigned means? Unfeigned. You can always depend on Jeff. They had the right word there. Or right, feigned means, in, means insincere. So unfeigned is sincere. <laughs> Why they use it that way, that's what the King Jimmy translators did. So they use unfeigned. Faith, unfeigned, sincere faith. Okay? And so Paul says here, now the end of the commandment. And so a lot of people want to spend, spend a lot of time on the front end, the, the beginning of the commandment. He says the end of the commandment is what? Is agape, love, out of a pure heart. Wow. Everybody say wow. Hallelujah. Um, it, it means uh, the pure heart has motives that are pure. Too often we see people under the guise of love with impure motives. Paul was concerned about a pure heart, a, 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 mo a pure or the right motive to heart. We have to have the right motives when we do things. Amen? I said amen. You can't have the, you know, if, you're, if your motives are impure, um, uh, it's going to catch up with you. It may not catch up with you right away. It'll catch up with you. Now I'm under grace. I don't care what you're under. You've got impure motives. It's going to catch up with you. All right? So Paul says the end of the commandment. Okay? The purpose of the commandment is love. But what kind of love? Love out of a pure heart or the right motive heart. And, and very interesting phrase up coming up here, of a good conscience. Now, the word good really, it, it, it means good. I mean, we could go into some different things, aspects of it, but it means good. The conscience here is, is interesting. I'm going to, um, it, it just has a lot of meaning here. Um, it literally means, how, how can you say this? Co-perception. Co and and what, what the, that meant was, that the, the Greek words literally meant co-perception. That that which was in the inner man caused the, the, uh, the processes, the thought processes, and governed the morality of the conscience. Let me say this. The conscience of, a, of an unsaved man is not good to follow. I'm just following my conscience. If you're not born again, you can't. This word comes from wording meaning that, that's governed from within. See, the born again man or woman, the believer, has the life of God in him. And then the life of God's the moral and the ethical code of God. Hello. That's, this is why I get upset with people, you know, um, when they take certain scriptures and they use them and they use them in a way that, that allows them to live contrary to the moral and ethical code of God. Because what it's telling me is, your, well, number one, your love is not out of a pure heart. Okay? You're looking for, you're, if you're looking for ways to violate God's moral and ethical code, there's something wrong with your relationship with the Lord. I know that went over real big. But you just can't say, well, my conscience doesn't, doesn't convict me. Uh, well, if you're being told that you never can be convicted, there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. You know, that means you can never be condemned no matter what you do. There's something wrong. Why? Because you're overriding the moral and ethical code of God. That is the seat in your spirit that, that, that governs your conscience. The, the co-perception, the inner man, the inner workings of, of God in you governing your conscience. It's where God speaks to you. You know, he governs, you know, he'll tell you, yes, that's wrong, don't do that. Even if you don't have scripture for it, you'll know it's not right. But you know, Paul talked about a seared conscience. Hello? One, one place, um, the word reprobate mind used over in Romans where it talks about, you know, he gave them over to a reprobate means of a conscience void of judgment. 
So you lose, you lose the ability to have judgment. In other words, you can't look at something and really discern right and wrong in it. If you're void of, 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 con, of, of judgment, you have a seared or a reprobate mind. Your conscience isn't right. It, you can't follow that. Well, how do we fix that? You learn to live from the inner man and, what the, and let the Word of God teach you. You, you know, you cannot approach the Bible that there are no, there's nothing in the Bible that, that's going to make me feel bad. You know, godly sorrow works repentance. Scripture says that. Scripture says that. That godly sorrow works or puts repentance into action. Why? So that you'll stop doing what you're doing. Why? Because it's violating God's moral and ethical code. And it's seated in your conscience. Hallelujah. And so... Um, So Paul, Paul did write in places about a pure conscience, a seared conscience, a defiled conscience. Now, if you've got a seared conscience, and then you're saying, well, my, my, my conscience doesn't convict me of doing whatever I'm doing. If your conscience is seared, it's not going to. You can't listen to it. How many of you ever, how many of you ever seared your finger before? Burn it. Guess what? You can't feel anything. That's what a seared conscience is like. You can't. It doesn't, it doesn't function the way it's supposed to. See, if, if I burnt my and I burnt my finger many times cooking in the restaurant, you know, you get burned, you get, you know, and, and it gets, actually, we got, we could, we could tell where the grease was hot enough by sticking a finger on the top of the grease. Because it got so seared, you know, from doing that, we just, we just didn't touch the grease. Stupid. Just say stupid. Hello. And, um, but you know, it, you know, it comes back later, but I mean, for a long time, you just, you just didn't feel things. See, when you get a seared conscience, how do you sear your conscience? You resist the truth. Consistently resist the truth. You don't walk in sound doctrine. You walk in that which pleases you. Under the guise of somehow or another, you're staying free and you're staying liberated and you're walking in a, in a new place in God and the whole time you're searing your conscience. Because on the inside, God's saying, you know, God, you know, God says something really interesting. Be holy for I'm holy. Ooh, smack. I knew that Batman thing where, you know, there. on this day I hereby notify that no one's allowed to use my pictures, whatever, Facebook. It's got Robin saying it's got Batman going, stop it. Smacking him upside the head. <laughs> you know, stop it. So, um, so we have here, you know, don't give heed to fables or myths and endless genealogies. Administer questions rather than uh, godly edifying, which is in faith. Now, the end of the commandment is, is the love of God out of a pure heart and of a good conscience. Your end of your faith is out of a pure heart and a good conscience. Now, if, I, if it says here's a good conscience, guess what kind of conscience you can have? Any statement like that, that's right. Any statement like this, there's an antithetical position. You could have a bad conscience. How do you develop a bad conscience? Resisting the truth. Okay? And of sincere faith. From which some, having swerved, have turned aside. This phrase, um, let me make sure I get the right words here. They have swerved, turned, they were desiring to be, but not understanding. Um... The phrase, here we go, that's right, turn aside unto vain jang jangling actually means, um, I mean, turn aside unto vain jangling means that they have, um, the, the, the context shows vain jangling to be the primary characteristic and activity of these false teachers. Um, they, it is it's a meaningless discussion, in, a discussion, empty argument, and purposeless talk. He said they turned aside from the truth and were so ignorant they could not even understand their own words. Now, have you ever talked to people who got caught up in some crazy doctrine and they just babble some of the dumbest stuff you've ever heard? And you're sitting there going, let me give you, let me give you an example. A number of years ago, I got this. I don't do this anymore, but I did then. I got the discussion about four years ago or so with this, this person on, on Facebook about Grace. Because they posted this. Here's what they posted. Because I'm under grace, I don't have to give, I don't have to tithe, I don't have to go to church, I don't have to submit, I don't have to obey. I don't have to give, I don't have to tithe, I don't have to submit, I don't have to obey, I don't have to go to church. Now there is a New Testament scripture. I'm not talking about, if you want to try to get real technical, I'm not even talking about the Gospels. I am talking about the epistles to the church. 
There is a scripture for every one of those that tells you to do it. Obey them when they will love you. Submit yourselves one to another. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as a manner of some. Amen? Give. You know, let every man give according to his purposes in his own heart, not begrudgingly nor necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And here, the Hebrew says that there he still receives our tithe. I got scriptures for every one of those. This person started off with this thing. Oh man, grace is so liberating. I don't have to do any of these things. I began to discuss with them. You know, I don't know where you're coming from, but the Bible tells you in the New Testament to do all these things. Well, God doesn't tempt us. Well, he put a, he put a tree in the middle of the garden and told Adam not to eat of it. You know what they told me? Adam didn't have the Holy Ghost like we do. That's what, you know, now, the, the, the non-compassionate size, you can't fix stupid. All right? But the reality, that's vain jangling, jangling. What do you mean they didn't have the Holy Ghost like we did? When God created Adam, he took his own breath, his own spirit, and breathed into that body. And part of God went into that body and became a speaking spirit. He didn't know sin. He was so much like God. The glory that came out of that body lit up and covered it in the glory. That's why he wasn't naked. He didn't have clothes. He was covered in the glory. When he committed high treason and rebelled against God, the glory went out and then he was naked because the light wasn't coming out anymore. Didn't have the Holy Ghost like we do. In the discussion, can't fix stupid, God help you. But what is that? That is that they've come to this place where they, um, uh, from which some having swerved what? Swerved away from the end of the commandment. The love with a good conscience, the faith unfeigned. They swerve from that un aside unto vain jangling. They don't even know what they're talking. They, they get, they're so confused, they don't even understand what they're talking about. When you turn away from the things of God. And I've heard people repeat stuff, and it, it just gets, you get confused listening to them. As a matter of fact, if you let them talk long enough, they'll contradict themselves in, in about two minutes. That's vain jangling. They, they, they're just, they, just, they just lost it, okay? Um, and the sum here, you know, which sum is, is, are the products of the false teachers. The Judaizers who've entered in, okay? Now, Paul had pointed out the fables in, in this genealogy were their, were their stock and trade. It was their meaningless discussion, empty argument, and purposeless talk. He also said they turned aside from the truth and were so ignorant they could not understand their own words. Okay, verse 8 begins an extended sentence. It goes all the way through verse 11. But we know that the law was good, to, if a man use it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man. Now, if you're born again, you don't need to be told, thou shalt not kill. It doesn't mean because you're not under the law, you can go kill. Now, some people come on and say, all things are lawful for me. No, you can't go kill people. All things are not expedient. Paul's not talking in absolutes there. Not everything, everything is not lawful for you. You are not allowed to kill. I don't care. That is, God, God did not deal with that in a slight manner when Cain killed Abel. Murder is still murder. Okay? All right? There are, there are moral things and some things that are lawful. And when Paul said, oh, you have to take the context of what he's talking about, it doesn't mean that you know, sleep with your neighbor's wife is lawful. Hello? We have to use a little more Bible sense and interpretation than just getting, you know, whatever. Well, all things, and usually people use it when they, want, they found something they want to do and they start saying, you know, well, it's all things lawful, but if I come up to you and say, okay, then, then I'm going to kill you. I'm going to put a gun in you and pull the trigger because that's lawful for me. It's not expedient, but it's, it's lawful. They're suddenly going to start quoting something about me not killing them. Well, didn't God say, thou shalt not kill? Oh, well, no, that's, that's, that's Old Testament. We're out of the Old Testament. I'm under grace. I can pull a trick and blow your head off, and it's okay. Because it's lawful. It's lawful for me. Okay? Now, as a believer, under, under the new birth, your character, your nature should not, should be different than it was before you got born again. Okay? The, the, uh, uh, the, the law was not made for righteous men and women. What do you mean? We, don't, we, we should not. And stop teaching that we can't. 
We should not have to tell you not to commit adultery as a believer. Now, for all of us men, they need to be told that. You know, Ten Commandments in the school is very good because you've got unsaved people in there. They need constraints. Okay? Courthouses need it. They need constraints. But the believer should be operating out from under the law of love. Now, grace does not automatically make you do that. There is no auto anything in the kingdom of God. It just isn't there, folks. The only auto thing was that when you confessed Jesus, you automatically got saved. But you didn't automatically begin to do everything he told you to do. As a matter of fact, you're told, to do, to, uh, as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. And then Paul rebuked the Hebrews. He said, for when you ought to be, uh, be teaching, you have uh, and meat and eating meat, you have need of milk again. Because they went backwards. Okay? So, he says here, the law is good if it's used lawfully. Knowing this, the law is not made for a righteous man. But for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly, for the sinners, the unholy, the profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves. And mankind. That is homosexuality. If you go look up the Greek, that's what it means. For men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, if there's any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. Okay? That's contrary to what? Sound doctrine. You know, there are things that are contrary to, to sound doctrine. The word sound here literally means health giving or denotes a wholesomeness of true Christian teachings. Only found, this word sound is only found in the pastoral epistles. Paul writing to pastors on how to teach their church. Give them health giving doctrine. Wholesome doctrine. Not not flip it stuff. That's why, you know, people love the traveling. No, listen, listen, I love traveling teachers and ministers. I love the different gifts. But there's a lot of times people love to hear, hear somebody because they don't, they're not the pastor. They can come in. They got a message that they're preaching. They believe God gave them a message for that year. They go to all the churches and preach that message everywhere they go. All right? And listen, there's been a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of good messages done that way. A lot of good teaching done. A lot of blessing brought to the body of Christ. Then the pastor gets up and, had, you know, oftentimes Paul would say one thing and then come back and balance it. Or they'd be silent. People hate that word. They hate that word so bad. They call it compromise. He would come back and temper it. He would temper that message. What do you mean? Preach on grace and then come right back. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. That's just one place he did that. Okay? But Paul, writing to his pastors... You gotta remember, he, he's Paul the agent. Remember, he said in Titus, he was Paul the agent. He's coming up on the end of all things. He knows, he knows his time is coming short. A year later, he writes to Timothy, said, I, I finished it. I'm done. I'm heading out. Make, make, get over here. We'll get there. Get over here as quick as you can because it's about over. About, it's about over, Timothy. But he's writing saying, make sure, you know, he says, th th these things that are contrary to sound, wholesome, help giving. Doctrine. The doctrine of the church. Pastors, you know, have to be the ones who bring the, the life-giving, wholesome doctrine to their congregation. It's their responsibility. They're commissioned by the head of the church, the Lord Jesus Christ, to do so. And see, there are things that are contrary to sound doctrine. Okay? Hey, now, you know, Paul didn't live, always give, a, and there's never, there's never a complete list in the Word. Even Deuteronomy, where it talks about, um, I mean, Exodus, where it talks about all the diseases that will come on you, da 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 and anything else like this, you know, uh, I, you know but I'll heal you because I'm the Lord that healeth thee. Remember, he, he, he lists all these things, and then anything else kind of like this. I mean, he, li he lists some nasty stuff. Emrods and all that kind of stuff. I mean, he just went on a whole tangent of stuff that's going to come on you if you break the law. Cooties, that's right. If there's anything that's contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God which was committed to my trust. What? The, sound, the contrary to sound doctrine is the, gospel, is the doctrine that was committed to Paul's trust in the gospel he preached. He preached grace. Yes, he did. He preached faith. He preached living right. He preached keeping your body under. Amen. 
He preached all of that. Yeah, Paul was the preacher of grace. But he's also the preacher of don't, don't yield your body, as, your members of service of unrighteousness. Okay? So he says here that this wholesome doctrine is according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to his trust. Now, Paul establishes to Timothy, not that Timothy need it, but people in that church area of Ephesus may need it, because there's always somebody coming in wanting to say, I, I've got more authority. We had a, a, a I guess it's been, it's been well over 20 years ago in this area. There was a good church in, in another city near here. Really good church. Good pastor. Doing a good job. And he got hooked up with some guy that was connected with our Bible school. Um, I, was, I was at the Bible school when this guy came in. He'd been on the mission field for a number of years. And he got in and got, he got, in and got uh, a letter from, from some ministers that, that recommended his ministry at the time. And they finally had to get up and say publicly, read the date on the letter. It's a five-year-old letter. and hadn't gotten a new one. Maybe something's not right. Because some things had changed. One of the things, he got caught up in this teaching on apostleship and stuff. And he would say, I'm an apostle, therefore I have authority over your church. And that pastor yielded authority to that guy and destroyed his, put his church out, put his church under. I mean, closed the doors. Because he was an apostle. Never made it back in full-time ministry like he was before. Okay? There's always somebody coming in looking for the advantage and the edge that don't have the pure motives that, that, that God didn't call, but they use scriptures. They use teachings to control and manipulate their, manipulate their way into power and authority in places God didn't grant them. Okay? So we as ministers have to be wise. Okay? And you, look, you don't have members in your church come to you. Oh, pastor, I, I, know, I know this person and they're awesome. They're a blessing. And then they're gone down the road six months after, after you found this guy's a nutbag. Or this woman, I've had women. You know, you went, I've seen women ministries that were nutbags. Okay? But Paul says here, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. All right? So he goes on. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Now stop. Paul said, hey, look. Now you make sure these people in Ephesus know. I know you know it, Timothy. Paul's his son. He's his son in the Lord. But I'm writing this. If you need a reference, here it is right in the letter. Jesus put me in this ministry. I'm doing what I'm doing by the commandment of God. Paul establishes his authority. In, and in do, doing so establishes Timothy's authority. Why? Because he's his son in the faith. Paul commissioned him there. Remember, what, what's, the, what's the premise of this letter? Verse 3, I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went to Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some they teach no other doctrines. This is the premise of this entire letter, of the beginning of this letter. Paul left Timothy there to keep things in order particularly in the realm of doctrine. All right? Then Paul goes on and says, who before was a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy, praise God, because I did it ignorantly and in belief. And the grace of the Lord was exceedingly abundantly with, with faith and love, uh, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save the sinners whom I am chief. <laughs> what's Paul doing? He's letting everybody know, look, not only am I set here as a, as, and set by God, but you know what? I came out of just as bad a place as you were. I'm worse than you were. In other words, it's, it's Jesus, came to, Jesus came to save the sinners. Jesus came into the world to save the sinners. And I was the chief one. I was a blasphemer. I was a persecutor. I was injurious. But I retained mercy because I did it in, un, I did it in, Ignorantly and unbelief. Okay? How be it, for this cause, I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern of them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Let's stop. What is Paul saying? He's not saying he's the first one that got saved, but he's been 30 years in the ministry since his conversion. And so he is the chief example of what God can do with, with a dirty, rotten, scoundrel sinner. He was a blasphemer. He was a persecutor. He was injured. He fed Christians to the lions. 
He was venomous. But 30 years later, Paul was able to say, I obtained mercy even in that state. Glory to God. I'm, the chief I'm, a, I'm a chief example of what the converting, saving, transforming power of Jesus Christ coming to him can do in a person's life. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So you think you're bad? Look at me. I was a blasphemer. I was a persecutor. I was injurious. But I got mercy. I got mercy. And now, 30 years later, he didn't say 30 years, but it's 30 years later. 30 years later, Paul says, I'm now the chief example of this, of what happens when you, Jesus came to the world to save the lost sinners. I'm the chief one. Look at my example. Look at me. Hallelujah. Brother Hagin used to say, the proof of the pudding's in the eating. Hallelujah. Look at my life for the last 30 years. That transformative power. The, 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 the new birth, being washed in the blood, hallelujah, of Jesus Christ. Look at my life now. I'm the chief example from blasphemy, persecutor, injurious, to the one who preaches Christ, to the one who preaches redemption, to the one who says no matter where you are, what you've done, what you've gone through, Jesus has an answer for you. You're, you can be born again. It doesn't matter because Jesus came to save you. Amen? Now, hallelujah, glory to God. And he ends up this whole um, um, thought with a doxology, okay? Now unto the king eternal, immortal, invisible, and only wise God. Hallelujah. What's, what's, king, what is, what is the God, what's God? He's king. He's eternal. That means he, he's not subject to death. He never will be subject to death. Immortal. Hallelujah. Um, invisible. The only God. The word wise, they don't even should be... Uh, phrased in there, uh, but the only God. What, what's him? Be honor and glory forever and ever. Okay? So, so here in verse 17, Paul uh, gives a doxology to what he's been talking about the last few verses. And um, he says, you know, that, um, that the word, you know, king literally is king of the ages. King eternal, I'm sorry. King eternal is king of the ages. The only, this is the only place where Paul uses this term in all of his writings. He calls him the king the, to the God eternal. Or the king eternal, king of the ages. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Um, probably the Jewish concept of the age that is and the one that's to come. You know, there's, you know immortal, not subject to death, invisible, unseen, unable to be seen. The eye of faith sees him. And then only wise God, or maybe perhaps better, only God who is worthy of what? Honor and glory forever and ever. Now, Paul here in the last three verses picks up his charge back up in verse 3. And Paul did that. He, he would side journey and come back. Kind of like Dad Hagen. Thought I forgot where I was, didn't you? <laughs> now you remember, I didn't want you to leave. I didn't want her to leave her out there. I want to pick up and finish the story. He'd come back the next day in class sometime and pick up where he left off. And you're like, how did he do that? You, how did he do that? I mean, he, you know, he's, he, he's kind of like a flow chart. <laughs> you come here and you branch down here and then you branch down here and you branch down here and then you got to close them all. You got to close all those gates <laughs> before you can go on. All that programmers know what I'm talking about. Hallelujah. You just can't leave it sitting there. You got to close it. Hallelujah. If you don't, especially if you're using do's or ifs, you get nested ifs or endless do loops. You'll be sitting there watching the computer go. What do you do? Turn it off, turn it back on. <laughs> Hallelujah. You used to have that little IBM System 3. You go up there and go, open the book up, and you got error 86. What do you do? You know, and usually there's one, there's one, two, or three recovery methods. And 95% of the time when I got a recovery method, it was three. Turn the system off and turn it back on. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. Um, but Paul picked up his charge here to his son Timothy. He uses military warfare uh, metaphors here. He says, uh, I charge, this charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee. Now remember, Timothy's mother and grandmother were, were uh, strong in the faith. He talks about this in one of his, one of his letters here as we're going through this. Uh, I'm talking about the faith that's in him that was also in his mother and his grandmother. P Timothy was a third generation believer. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And he and this is, you know, people don't listen. Uh, Jesse posted something today or yesterday about, you know, these people who, 
or maybe it wasn't just somebody said it on Facebook. I just saw it. You know, these people who say, I, "Well, I don't want to teach my children, my children, my religion. I want them to come on their own." Uh, apparently, that's not what the Bible teaches. We're to train them. And as long as you're in my house, you're going to live this way. You're going to do it. You know, you've got to come to your own faith. I get that. But Timothy must have lived under the, the, the rule of his mother and grandmother, and he came to that same faith. He wasn't given the option to go out and live like the devil. And you're stupid if you do that. I'm just going to let my kids figure it out for themselves. You're just stupid. Everybody say stupid. You don't do that. Hello. You don't, you don't, you don't incite appetites in them. Hello. Glory to God. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies that went before thee, that thou by them, those prophecies, mightest war a good warfare. Now listen, folks. He, he was a pastor. He's going to have to fight stuff. He's going to have to deal with stuff. He's going to have to take authority over it. Amen? Listen to this. Holding faith or keeping your faith. Holding fast to your faith. And a, here we are again, aren't we? What? Good conscience. Same, same phrase. A good conscience. Keeping your faith and a good conscience. As the pastor, he had to live a, a, a certain way. He had, to, he had to do things with a good conscience. He couldn't do them with a bad conscience. I, I'm just, you know, I, I get amazed at some of the things pastors are doing these days because they're free. I'm going to tell you something. You may be free, but you're causing other people to stumble. If you're doing stuff that causes other people to stumble, I don't care how free you are. You're in bondage. Thank you. Holding faith, keeping your faith, and a good conscience. Boy, it's good to lay down at night and know your conscience is clear. Because you did, you did things the way the Word of God teaches and the way God said do it. And live an honorable before the Lord. Amen? Which some having put away. Now this, this, this word here, put, these two words put away. Um, that, was, that was kind of an interesting thing here. Um, I'm trying to find it here. It, it, it actually implies a violent and deliberate rejection of one's personal conscience. I have seen Christians try to convince other Christians it's all right to drink. Fight to prove it's okay to drink. Why? Because they want to validate their position on it. And then other Christians will fall into that because they've got, they, they're, they're persuasive. But they have an upheaval going on in them against their own conscience and convictions. I've seen people do it. I remember I was in Estonia a few years ago uh, and, and with people that I had taught in Bible school when they first got saved and, and everything, but they had gotten off on this thing about drinking, and all they wanted to do was try to tell everybody how, how it was fine to drink, and they were trying to prove their case. They, I just came in from America, and all you want to talk about is okay to drink. How about let's talk about Jesus? Let's talk about the blood of Jesus. Let's talk about being born again. Let's talk about being flowing in the Holy Ghost. Let's talk about the gifts of the Spirit. Now, they want to try to prove their point. Why? Because they want to validate their position that it's okay. Now, that's just drinking. People do that in all kinds of stuff. They'll come to other Christians who don't have the liberty that they have. And the reason they're trying to do it is they really don't have the liberty. They're just trying to get enough people. And they think if they get enough people to agree with them, then it's okay. That went over big. I heard the internet go, amen. Actually, the whole internet just went down all over the world for two seconds. <laughs> amen? No, Paul's telling Timothy, keep your faith. Hold fast to your faith with a good conscience, which some having put away, having violently, violently, I mean, not just, you know, um, and deliberately rejected. What's the end of that? Have made, concerning faith, have made shipwreck. There are believers that become shipwreck because they don't hold to faith, they don't hold fast to their faith, they don't keep their faith, and they don't keep a good conscience. And they fall under the control of another person who wants to justify their position on things, you know, don't like what Pastor Ed preaches, so they go out there and they try to get enough people to agree with him that they're right and he's wrong. And they, and they reject these things, and then they end up shipwrecked. I can't tell you how many times I've seen it happen. 
I've seen them shipwrecked. I've seen them shipwrecked. I've seen them lo lo lose out with God. I've seen them backslide to the point they went back into their old lifestyles like they used to be in to the point that they, they couldn't even function anymore. One person, they ended up, well, somebody was, was in our church, was a, was a drug trafficker. Got them, they got saved, got turned to the Lord, went to the court. Judge let them off. Somebody got, got upset about something. Got, they got caught up with them. You know, they, they listened to all the, they, they, be, they didn't hold fast their faith. They became shipwrecked, went back out, ended up going back out. Uh, the husband and wife ended up divorced. And then he ended up uh, hooked on drugs. She ended up selling drugs. And he died of a heart attack at about 40 years old. Are you trying to scare us? No, 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 no. I'm trying to make sure you don't get shipwrecked. Hello? We can't, we can't afford to be shipwrecked. Paul's charged Timothy. He's charged them to, be, to hold fast faith. He's charged them to preach with a good conscience. He's charged them to make sure they're in sound doctrine. And now he's giving examples that some have violently and deliberately rejected those things that they knew. And then he even goes on and names a couple of guys. Of whom is Hymenius and Alexander... Want to hear a little grace? Whom I've delivered unto Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. <laughs> Twice we had Paul deliver somebody. Remember the, 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 uh, the uh, man whose wife had took up with his, step, with his son? His, his, the son took up with his stepmama? And they were just letting him come to church because, oh, we just love people. We just love it. Oh, just come on over here because we love you. Paul said, listen, this all not to be. The Gentiles don't even do this stuff. So when you get together next week, I'm coming, but I'm coming in the spirit. I'm turning them over to Satan to destroy their flesh. Their spirit be saved in the day of the Lord. In other words, it was to, it was to bring them back. But he said, you know, you, you, we ain't going to have this mess in the church. Hello? Here he comes over here and goes, these guys have violently and deliberately turned on their faith. They're not holding fast their faith. They're not having a good conscience. So I'm going to turn them over to the devil. And I'll just tell you who they are. Just named them right here in the church. Now, apparently, they were part of the congregation. How do you know? How do you know they're part of the congregation? Because he said, the, which some of concerning our faith have put away, you know, um, concerning faith have made shipwreck. Having some put away concerning faith have made shipwreck. Of whom is, and he names Hymenius and Alexander. And he delivered them over to Satan so that they may not learn to blaspheme. I tell you, if Paul was in the church today, there's a whole lot of teaching that would get shut down real quick. And there'd be people getting on television talking about how Paul was, was legalistic and Paul was this and Paul was that. And he'd say, I don't really care what, you're, what you think of me or my stature or my head or anything else. I, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ. I didn't confer with flesh and blood. Jesus gave this to me, and, I, and I'm carrying it out. Boom! Paul probably went, boom! <laughs> On people. Got, got you now. Got your attention. So he, he picks up again here after, you know, verse 3, he, tell, he charges Timothy. Here in verse 18, he picks up, or 17, he picks up on that charge once again and finishes out this chapter on his charge to Timothy. So Timothy has a charge. What's that? He's to teach people the truth. He's to teach it with a good conscience. He's to teach it, make it sure they understand that the end of their faith is love of the pure heart and a good conscience and it's sincere faith. If it's all about you, it ain't what, that's not what he's talking about. Amen. So next week we're going to pick up in chapter 2 because I'm, I'm going to have to get y'all an opportunity to go take your um, repent pills because I'm going to say I pray therefore I exhort therefore first of all supplication prayers and intercessions giving of thanks be made for all men for kings that would include and all that are in authority that would include presidents vice presidents now if you're not here next week I'll know why Hello? Didn't say for godly kings. Now, the people rejoice when the, when the righteous rule. I get that. We got to be praying, you know, that, that uh, 
the, the decisions made by people in authority are the right decisions. And that they're forted in their ability to make the wrong decisions. God will just arrest their mind won't let them do it. Hello? Now, if God needs to make them go crazy to keep them from hurting the, the church, he, he did that to, that happened to an Old Testament king. He lost his mind. Y'all remember that? Who was that, Bill? Nebuchadnezzar. Went nuts so. You can't rule with your nuts. Amen? All right. We'll get to that next week. Y'all enjoy this, this first chapter, Timothy? All right. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.